A pleasant Tuesday to all. The Financial Stability Coordination Council, or the FSCC, welcomes everyone to the public release of the Macroprudential Policy Strategy Framework, the case of the Philippines. We are recording these proceedings for streaming purposes through the Facebook page and the YouTube channel of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Joining us today is the Chairman of the FSCC, BSP Governor Benjamin E. Diokno. The following executive committee members are also with us virtually via WebEx. Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Emilio B. Aquino, the Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation President Roberto B. Tan, Insurance Commission Deputy Commissioner George S. Onkeko Jr. in behalf of Commissioner Dennis B. Funa. Also with us is BSP Assistant Governor and FSCC Technical Secretariat Head, Dr. Jo Johnny Noe E. Ravalo. Today, all FSCC member agencies come in full force to release the country's macroprudential policy strategy framework. This is a milestone for the Philippines as we join other countries that have publicly released their respective frameworks. This event informs a broader audience about how the FSCC envisions the financial stability agenda, particularly the design and deployment of macroprudential policies. At this point, may we request FSCC Chairman and BSP Governor Benjamin E. Diokno for his statement. Good morning to all our friends from the financial market, multilateral agencies, and the media. Three weeks ago, the FSCC held a press briefing with two important messages. First, that the 2019 coronavirus disease is different from prior crises because it is a direct shock to the real economy, to supply chains, and to the welfare of families and individuals. Second, based on our reading of a wide array of indicators, and our own surveillance of what is happening on the ground, we do not see any indications as of yet that our financial market has been impaired irreparably. As the Council convened after the global financial crisis, our task has always been about ensuring the health of the financial system so that it remains a pillar for the financial consumer. Financial authorities have come to understand that there is something about the risk behaviors of various financial market stakeholders that creates outcomes for the system that cannot be tracked by simply overseeing the balance sheets of individual market stakeholders. As I mentioned at our last press briefing, that something is the way risk behaviors connect, complement, and correlate with each other, creating a new channels of risk through contagion. Today, the Council is again with you to share another milestone. Just as we had the opportunity three weeks ago to launch the Financial Stability Report on its maiden semester release, we have invited you today for the public release of the country's macroprudential policy strategy framework. There is a bit of a tongue twister, but at its core, the framework reflects how your financial authorities define systemic risk, how we are monitoring changes in risk behaviors, and how we are moving forward in managing this policy concern. The overarching concern is that of financial stability, which is specifically about managing systemic risk. This risk, in turn, are specifically defined, consistent with global understanding and practice, and the means for taking action are what we refer to as macroprudential policy, to help put all, the, all of the different components the framework document includes a scoping statement that defines the perimeter of our work 
on systemic risk management. We remain crystal clear that price stability as well as the safety and soundness of banking institutions are important policy objectives. But we are as clear that cash, capital, and independent markets together with clearing and settlement should be collectively considered when talking about the financial system. Macroprudential policy does not take away from any existing objective. It adds another facet to our desire for the financial market to be a value proposition. Ultimately, the goal is to ensure that our financial system works for us and facilitates in improving the welfare of individuals, from savers to borrowers, to investors and issuers, to intermediaries, to infrastructure operators, and digital service providers. Speaking as a central banker, we understand the added challenges that macroprudential policy put forward. But we are also committed to the value proposition of finance and to making the financial system increasingly resilient to different forms of shocks. We are proud to take on the mantle of financial stability as part of our mandate under Republic Act number 11211, the amended charter of BSP, which President Duterte signed into law in February 2019. We also recognize that financial stability is a collective effort, and thus the FSEC principles are here with you today. Collectively, the FSEC is thankful that the review of our macroprudential framework is central to the Financial Sector Assessment Program, or FSAP, currently being completed by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. With this framework, we are joining the list of nations who subscribe to the global best practice of releasing to the public the macro potential policy framework. We look forward to the insights from the FSUP expert panel so that our macro potential policy framework best contributes to a well functioning financial system. This should include the work of our systemic risk crisis management framework. This framework represents the Council's enduring commitment to manage systemic risk at the highest level of policy. While we are happy to announce the strategy framework today, getting at this point certainly has been a journey. From the initial efforts of Governor Titanco to the developments introduced by Governor Espinilla. It is now my honor to take the baton in this never ending relay of making the Philippine financial system an enabler for the Filipino people. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Governor, for his statement. statement. May we call on SEC Chairman and FCC Executive Committee Member Emilio B. Aquino. Good morning, everyone. Regulators and academicians have talked about systemic risk for decades. That conversation goes back a long time, even further than the discussion between risk and uncertainty. But the traditional understanding of systemic is synonymous with sight. In Asian financial systems, the tendency was to look first towards banks as the biggest players in the market. The 2007 global financial crisis and arguably today's COVID-19 pandemic changed that perspective. Systemic risk is now understood as a disruption anywhere in the financial system that can ultimately have a negative impact on the economy. The term system takes a holistic view and it no longer matters whether a particular financial market is bank or market-based, 
What matters is how the different parts are interlinked through risk behaviors. At the Securities and Exchange Commission, our contribution to this discussion is principally on two fronts. Regulating different facets of the capital market and a role with non-financial corporations or the regular corporations. Today's situation puts a spotlight on these two facets. As was mentioned by the technical secretariat during the press briefing in June, our immediate task now is to reboot the economy with the help of the financial market, refinance maturing debt obligations, and to reprice risk premium. These are all capital market concerns. Understandably, there are mark banking risks that COVID-19 has enhanced, not only because credit risk has risen under the global recession, but more so because bank credit risk cannot be independent of addressing the liquidity needs of depositors. The investor-issuer relationship is generally a different risk profile, but to make the funding available, issuer and panel risk do have to be discovered. That calls for a secondary market that has breadth and depth, as well as an efficient way to capture actual trade transactions. We want to give comfort to entrepreneurs going into the capital market that the cost of accessing capital is premised on best information available. This is not to say that only financial institutions and investors matter. To the contrary, the capital market is for issuers, financial or non-financial in nature. This cannot be overly stated, especially under the present market conditions. We need to rebuild what COVID-19 has eroded and that will require a fair amount of medium-term capital. If we are to leverage the benefits of this market, we must see it as a platform for mitigating systems risk. We must invest in better data capture and in fact, have available more granular data as other jurisdictions already have. For example, our cross-border debt obligations is available from a handful of reporting central banks around the world. But consistent information would help the macro prudential authority in accessing possible pressure points. The SEC welcomes the release of our macro prudential policy strategy framework, reminding us that the outcomes of the system and the consequential risk are born out of the way all stakeholders are interconnected. With the FSCC as the platform, the SEC looks forward to ensuring that all parts of the system are up to task of serving the Filipino consumer. Thank you. Thank you, SEC Chairman Aquino. We will now listen to the statement of PDIC President F Executive Committee Member Roberto B. Tan. Good morning to everybody. I share the uh, sentiments of my colleagues in the FSCC of the importance of this public release of our macro prudential policy strategy framework. As a deposit insurance corporation, we provide a safety net for savers who have delegated their savings to the care of banks. These savers do not participate in the day-to-day -day operations of their chosen bank and providing the safety net is couched on what economists refer to as asymmetric information. This just to uh, an echo term for depositors who really do not know firsthand what the bank is doing with the money the depositor has, entrust, has in, entrusted to the bank. From a systemic risk standpoint, this concern cannot and should not be limited to the specific status of a particular financial institution. There is a higher calling in taking a look at the health of the system, specifically in the way banks interact with one another, with other financial institutions, and with both depositors and borrowers. 
This is also because experience and history tells us that there is a difference between how financial institutions operate and the well-being of the collective system. It has been described in different phrases, but we know that what may be in the best interest of a bank does not always mean that it is best for the industry. This is why credit and leverage of a bank does not always mean that this is why credit and leverage tend to fluctuate in cycles. Enhanced risk aversion constricts the availability of credit at the bank level, but its collective effect is to all and the more and more erode economic prospects. Exuberant lending, on the other hand, is a race for market share, but at some point, too much of useful resource will eventually turn the economy towards a correction. As the world has become more integrated, so too have financial markets in their own jurisdictions. We support the view of the FSCC that systemicness cannot be fully defined by the size of balance sheets. Rather, it's about the pervasiveness of effects which arise from the way in our example, banks are heavily integrated with the, re re with the real economy. This is why there's been much work done in incorporating a systemic risk macroprudential policy overlay on bank resolution regimes. It is no longer about a bank, but how the failure of such bank affects the economy or how failure elsewhere affects some banks which can trigger another round of vulnerabilities. In some jurisdictions, a check and balance system is in place so that resolution in, 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 is a financial stability concern, separate from regulation and oversight. We are also well aware that standard met metrics for bank health assesses the, the risks that they have taken on books, but this assessment does not include the risks that their counterparties are exposed to. Again, and to be clear, this is not to say that risk assessments of counterparties is incorrect, but it is a reminder that the counterparties have their network of counterparties and so that the full effects require us to look at these direct and indirect loops. At the FSCC, we have been take, talking of networks and performing what-if analysis on these networks. And I'm happy to leave the math behind the clickages of the FSCC Technical Secretariat, but I find these networks to reflect possible channels of risk contagion. These networks and other tools are embedded in the strategy document that we are pub publicly releasing today, and I encourage our stakeholders to get acquainted with the overall framework. At the PDIC, we are fully committed to our role as the operator of the safety, safety net infrastructure, more so in the context of our joint interest in managing systemic risks via macro prudential policy. Thank you. And finally, now call on IC Deputy Commissioner and FSCC Executive Committee Member George S. Onkeko Jr. Morning, everyone. Among the financial submarkets, the insurance sector is admittedly the smallest. In decades past, the contingent market and performance has been relatively modest. But in the course of the last decade, it appears that the sector has found its foothold in the financial industry. Within that span of time, the insurance sector's asset tripled, and currently, 60 population already have life insurance problem. What is interesting is that the global standard setting bodies introduced the concept of systematically important financial institutions, or SIFIs. These are institutions that the industry more directly than others. And when the SIFIs were identified, the immediate lists were for banks and insurers. 
standard setting bodies saw something of this systematically important insurers. And in the language of our industry, there were two reasons for this. Analysts often cite the domino view where the failure of an insurer creates a secondary round of ill effects on others. In the nature of the industry, because insurable risks are also often reinsured. Then there is the tsunami view, where otherwise healthy insurance firms amplify and spread risks throughout the system. This happens insurance for financial transactions, especially when these contracts do not assess the effects of the insurance on other parts of the financial system. In this sense, even insurers, which are otherwise healthy, would spread systematic. Aside from interlinkages of institutions within the financial system, there has always been focus on the insurance contract itself. Prior work by, by the IMF, for example, shows the life insurance contracts have been more sensitive to interest rate movements and thus create another facet of potential channel for systematic systemic risks. While the empirical estimate suggests that insurers are less systemic than banks, the that is, when it comes to systemicness, our concern must be about connections that link one pressure to the next, creating a network of points of contact. The Insurance Commission welcomes the release by the FSCC of the Macro Prudential Policy Strategy Framework because both the domino and tsunami views are incorporated in our strategy framework. A closer reading of the strategy document shows how we will address common sensitivities such as from market yields. This reiterates our shared view within the Council of the effects of contagion, complementaries, correlations, and connectedness of the entire financial system. As the insurance regulator, we will stay focused regardless of whether the shocks come from, the knock-on effects of failed institutions, or in the bro broader normal course of contingent market operations. Another aspect of the strategy document is critical, that of communication which in turn I take in its broadest terms. It is important for authorities to signal dynamic risks in general, as it is our most powerful tool in reaching out to the end user of financial products. We can just imagine how a potential retiree would feel when his anticipated fund does not materialize because risk conditions drastic toward market yields or investment risks have significantly increased. He will see it as not meeting his target rather than our best efforts to contain risks in his behalf. So much then will still need to be done, largely because risks change with evolving market conditions. We are in such a situation now with COVID-19, and the IC is determined to take its share of managing systemic risks in the financial system. The macro prudential policy is our anchor. Thank you. Commissioner Unkeko, we are now ready to entertain questions from the press. May I now turn over the floor to Assistant Governor Ravalo to moderate the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alicia, and uh, good day to everyone. Um, and I'd like to specifically thank our colleagues from the media who have provided advanced questions uh, while during the Q&A session, we will certainly welcome any other additional questions that uh, you may have uh, for our principals. I also wanted to thank the other market participants who are also on this call and uh, look forward to engaging further. So just going by the questions that we have received from the media, uh, allow me to read some of them and perhaps I can invite uh, our principals to, to address them. The first question is from Joan Villanueva of the Philippine News Agency. She asks, what are the additional challenges contributed by the COVID-19 pandemic that has made macroprudential policy more difficult today? Governor, would you care to take that one? Oh. 
Unlike in previous crises, the main cause of the ongoing pandemic is not rooted in financial markets. Traditionally, our focus is on maintaining the health of the financial system so that it does not adversely affect the broader economy. The challenge today, however, is the exact opposite. We want to be sure that the difficulties do not spill over from the economy to the financial market. So from the Council's per perspective, we are looking at things differently from what we used to. Admittedly, COVID can still affect financial markets through risk aversion and income erosion, among others. While the financial system remains strong, we have to remain vigilant of any possible spillovers. Thank you, Governor. I, there is a related question from uh, Lawrence of Kauai Philippine Star. Uh, he asks, how would you differentiate the macroprudential policies adopted under the COVID-19 pandemic versus that of the GFC as well as the AFC? You mentioned in your um, response earlier that uh, there's a little bit of a difference. So perhaps you can elaborate further? Yeah, there are two sides to this story. We have learned from previous difficulties while also recognizing that COVID-19 is a different type of crisis altogether. Unlike 1997, interest rates are lower today, so we are not choking off liquidity, like in, and like in 20, 2007, rather, we know that temporary regulatory relief is important to give the financial market space to rebalance. But COVID-19 is expected to be much more severe. So we have to think this early of what the new economy will be so when we, so we can prepare in advance. Following up on a question from Lawrence, uh, he asks, how do you intend to prevent systemic risks in the future? And what lessons were learned under the current health crisis? Would I, uh, can I invite the uh, SEC Chair Aquino to respond? Okay. Um, Macroprudential policy as it is formulated has kept an eye on what have uh, we learned uh, from the 2007 global financial crisis. We often say that we are taking continuous steps to make the financial system more resilient to external shocks as well as to shocks uh, that such a system has created for itself. But no one, no one could have really imagined a pandemic of this nature. And an integrated global economy has provided the channels of amplification. On the side of the FSCC, having this framework publicly released is just our baseline. As a council, we are working preemptively on a number of things, including a framework that involves a crisis due to systemic risk in the financial market. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have a number of questions from uh, Warren de Guzman of ANC. Um, I noticed though that uh, perhaps I can combine two questions from Warren. Uh, one question is that uh, what are the observations of the group in terms of financial stability based on the latest data collected? He also asks, NEDA Secretary Carl Chua just noted last Friday that the impact of COVID-19 on the economy may be more severe than anticipated by the DC EBCC. What is the view of the Council on this one? Uh, perhaps I can revert back to the Chair. All right. Uh, a reasonable expectation is for Q2 2020 figures to be much worse than Q1. That's, that's elementary. We have also said that the impact of COVID-19 is broader than early assessments. And this suggests that we are looking at a U-shaped recovery. We fully recognize the challenges that are out there today but we also cannot stay idle and allow the economy to collapse. The prudent approach is a calibrated 
opening of the economy. Certainly, the current situation cannot be binary. It's not an either or effect, but uh, so the council does I need to look forward to all the potential issues. But perhaps, uh, President Bobby, can you would you like to follow through on that particular point? Uh, sir, you have to turn on your mic, please. Mike, uh, Bobby, can we ask you to, I think your mic is off. Okay, sorry about that. I, uh, the council wants to be sure that the financial system is an enabler of recovery. There should be enough liquidity in the system to meet uh, uncertainties that may be priced into market yields. Uh, it also uh, means keeping stakeholders updated so that everyone can make well-informed decisions. But the financial market is not a separate silo from the rest of the economy. That is why we have been collaborating with uh, our economic uh, agency, NEDA, and in fact, uh, Secretary Chua attended the FSCC meeting earlier. you uh, Bob um, Warren has a, an interesting question he he asks have banks been too cautious in terms of lending or is more caution warranted uh, since it's uh, start with the banks may I again call on the chairman for this particular question uh, we often see our banks as the source of the loans but we should also consider that the funds they lend out are coming from the deposits of the public. The 10.4 trillion in loans outstanding of the banking system as of May is really not being funded. It's really rather being funded by the 12.1 trillion in peso deposits. So we certainly are not saying that banks should not lend. What the council is saying is that we appreciate the balance of risk that we believe that the capital market has a critical role to play right now because its own balance of risk between issuer and investor is very different from the risk between borrowers and depositors. Well, Governor, talking about the capital market, perhaps uh, Chair Emil will have a few thoughts on this issue as well. Uh, yes, uh, AG uh, know it. Uh, let me just add there, no? uh, exactly uh, that was a point that I made in my uh, brief uh, remarks. Uh, throughout our history, the banking industry has provided the bulk of financing. We, are, uh, we have a bank-dominated uh, environment here. But that also meant that uh, borrowers and entrepreneurs had to bear both the liquidity and tenor mismatches. Our thinking at the council is that these borrowers and entrepreneurs are reassessing their opportunities. And we believe that the capital market can be the game changer uh, for our common goal of a new and better economy. But we have to also think of a broader and deeper capital market to make these opportunities uh, come to fruition. That phrase has been said so often, but uh, the FSCC has uh, specific action items for this. Essentially, it boils down to uh, more transparent and accessible uh, discovery of risk prices, uh, rising from much more active uh, market turnover, which uh, in turn is coming from deeper markets. Thank you, Chair Emil. Uh, you, you had mentioned that uh, specific out action items. Uh, we have, uh, on that point, we have a question from SIG Delegado of Bloomberg. He asks, how ready is the FSCC in deploying the framework should the need arise? So I guess that goes, uh, it segues into the release of the document right now. Um, may I ask uh, President Bobby to take that question? Uh, okay, uh, thank you again. I think we should uh, clarify that using the framework for macro prudential policy is not going to depend on whether we are in stressed or normal times. 
Even before COVID-19, the FSCC Technical Secretariat was busy analyzing the what-if scenarios that could trigger systemic difficulties. So uh, we should not only react when systemic risks happen, but we should be very preemptive in our approach. In fact, the best, case, the best case is for the reactive measures not to be used because that means that we are successful in preventing systemic risks to materialize. But financial markets are never static and uh, risk behaviors do, not, do change under stress conditions. And uh, so the technical work premised by this framework is also very conscious of self-fulfilling risk behaviors when something triggers heightened uncertainties. So uh, this is also why we have uh, repeatedly said that our point of view is to assess the health of the system by looking at the interlinkages between and among stakeholders and how these linkages evolve with the, with the changing markets. And, uh, very quiet. So maybe I can ask him to add a few thoughts on this point. Thank you, AJ Ravalo. I just want to support that point. While we all recognize that some shocks just come as a surprise, the very point of having the macroprudential policy framework is to look ahead and minimize surprises. So in normal times, we should assess what may happen. This is the same in stress times. We have to be sure we are not risking too much of the future in our desire to get out of the current stress. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner George. Um, we have a series of questions from Lee Chipongen of, of Manila Bulletin, and, and I think this is clearly for uh, the governor and, and the FSCC chair. Essentially, she asks about the latest 50 basis point uh, policy rate decision of the Monetary Board. So, Governor, if I would just read the questions. As pointed out in the BSP's uh, financial stability report, if there is to be an upside to COVID-19, it is that inflation is expected to stay low. The FSR also said that there is no illiquidity, no liquidity squeeze, rather. So the first uh, two questions can be combined. Uh, she asks, if there is no liquidity squeeze and there is in fact excess liquidity in the system, why has the monetary board reduced the policy rate recently by another 50 basis points? A similar question is, and if both the 2020 and 2021 inflation forecasts were adjusted higher from 2.2% to 2.3% in 2020 and 2.5 to 2.6% in 2021, why did this lead to a policy rate cut? Governor? By reducing the policy rate gives the economy extra boost. We build resilience because we do not unnecessarily burden existing borrowers with higher debt servicing at a time when market uncertainty is high. Again, this was an important lesson from 1997. The lower policy rate likewise reduces the incentive for hot money to come in, but only to take advantage of the interest rate differential between the Philippines and, and for example, U.S. rates. With the lower rates, we can also better manage longer-term uncertainties. At this point, inflation is not really our top issue. The policy rate move was premised on our reading of the macro financial situation rather than any outlook, outward, rather outward, outward indication that inflation would get out of hand. Governor uh, Lee follows that up with uh, another question. She asks, uh, have, has the lower policy rates filtered down to the bank levels? Yes, we have seen that there is a pass-through from the policy rate to bank lending rates. How each bank reacts to the policy rate through will differ from bank to bank because of differences in their own circumstances. However, 
we should clarify that the policy rates is a signal to the rest of the economy and not just to banks. In the government securities market, yield curves have come off their peak in March. That's a benefit to those who seek fresh capital to the securities market. And with rates lower, the repricing of term obligations likewise declines, helping existing borrowers at this time of great difficulties. Okay, let me just check with Elisha, okay, if there are no other questions. I, there, are, there was an additional question that was raised, um, and I, this is directed to uh, Deputy Commissioner George. Uh, Commissioner, the question really is uh, rather pointed. Why is managing systemic risk even important? Aren't all risks an issue anyway from, the, from a policy and regulatory perspective? Thank you for the question, A.G. Ravalo. Financial authorities have always looked at the health of the financial system. There's nothing new to that intention. What is unique, though, to macroprudential policy is that the world learned from the global, global financial crisis that it is not enough to supervise institutions because risks end up commingling and influencing other market participants. We have to look at the financial system where the outcomes cannot be just the sum of what you see from the regulated entities. There is something else that goes on at the level of the system that goes beyond our traditional market segments. And this is why you see the FSCC as a collaborative effort among authorities. Thank you. And maybe as a segue to that particular point, uh, may I ask the chair, uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, George talked about why managing systemic risk is important. Uh, may I ask the governor, uh, why is uh, this national strategy document uh, important. Can't we not just keep it among the FSCC members? Why is it that we would like the public to know? Lauren? I echo the sentiments of the rest of the FSCC principles in pointing out that systemic risk cuts across the entire market. It does not only affect the business community, banks, security mm -hmm. firms, insurance companies, or the financial infrastructure underpinning the market. Systemic risk affects the well being of the general public. With this release, the FSEC wishes to assure our stakeholders that we are focused on keeping the financial system resilient and a value proposition to all. This document formalizes our efforts, but it's not the first and certainly won't be the last of what we are doing to manage systemic risk via macro potential policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor. I think uh, that very much summarizes what the FSCC is trying to do. And on that uh, excellent point, may I turn over the floor back to our MC, Alicia. Thank you, Assistant Governor Ravalo. At this point, we would like to ask um, our FSCC principals to turn towards their cameras for a brief photo opportunity. We also request our guests who are joining us today via WebEx to turn on their cameras and also our media friends. Thank you. The Macroprudential Policy Strategy Framework may be downloaded through the websites of the BSP, the SEC, the PDIC, and the IC. Thank you very much to our FSCC principals, members of the press, press, and our online viewers. For clarifications on the framework or any FSCC-related query, the council may be reached at email fsc at bsp.gov.ph, facebook.com slash fsccph, and 5306-2938. That's the telephone number here at the BSP. This concludes today's FSCC press event. We appreciate everyone's time and attention this morning. We will now end our broadcast. Maraming salamat po at magandang araw sa ating lahat.